In this video, we're going to speak about bones, joints, and muscles in general. First of all, bones can be divided into three broad categories depending on their shape – lung, short, and flat. The lung bones, whose dimension clearly prevails over the other two, are named after the shape that has two epiphyses. The proximal epiphysis, that is to say the one closer to the skull, and the distal epiphysis, the one farther from the skull. The bony portion between the two epiphyses is called the diaphysis. In between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is a thin line, the child's growth plates in early life, and this is called the metaphysis. Then there are the flat bones, where two dimensions clearly prevail over the third. An example is the sternum. Finally, there are the short bones, where all dimensions are more or less comparable. An example are the vertebrae. Actually, there are also bones that hardly fall into a precise classification, and therefore are defined as irregular. As for the histology of bone, it is composed of a spongy part and a compact part, which in turn is composed of osteons, in the middle of which are vessels that nourish the bone. The bone lamellae are soaked into osteocytes, giving the bone its typical microscopic appearance. For more on this part, the relative video can be found in the histology playlist. But let's move on to the joints. Joints are structures that join two or more bones and do not necessarily result in mobility. As a matter of fact, the first difference when it comes to joints is precisely this. There are joints called synarthrosis, which are fixed joints, and joints called diarthrosis, which are mobile. Among the synarthrosis, the most important and prevalent are the sutures. The two articular surfaces that articulate are already almost completely complementary. What helps connect them completely is a very thin layer of fibrous connective tissue. Obviously, sutures do not allow mobility. Belonging to this type, harmonic sutures, where two articular surfaces are complementary and their line of interaction is flat, dente sutures, where two bones interdigitate, squamous sutures, where the two articulating aspects are slightly inclined and one interlocks the other, and then skin the lessus, a very special type of suture that occurs between two articular surfaces, one of which is represented by a ridge and the other is a groove that the ridge fits into. Well, an example, perhaps the only one, is the joint between the anterior crest of the sphenoid bone and the wings of the vomer. Other serarthrosis are the symphysis, the synchondrosis, and the conphosis. The symphysis is where we can find fibrous cartilaginous disc between the articular surfaces. The synchondrosis, where the articular surfaces are juxtaposed and covered by a thin layer of healing cartilage. The gonfosis is where the root of the tooth, which is not bony, binds alveoli through a large number of collagen fibers, thus anchoring the tooth to the alveolus. The arthrodial joints, on the other hand, are mobile joints. The two articular surfaces are complementary. For example, is one is spherical, the other is concave and contains a sphere. Where they intersect, they are covered by helin cartilage. In addition to this, there may be a real cartilaginous disc in the cavity, aimed at increasing the cavity depth. The whole structure is held together by ligaments and by a capsule, composed of an inner and an outer layer. The inner layer is very thin and more technically called synovial membrane. It has the function to produce a particular liquid called synovial fluid, a liquid that fills the joint cavity and reduces the friction between the articular surfaces. The outermost layer of the capsule, however, is a simple fibrous connective tissue that provides physical resistance to the joint. This function isn't only carried out by the capsule, but also, and above all, by the ligaments. The first type of the arthrodial joint is condylarthrosis, which is between a cavity and a confins and oblong, almost olive-shaped structure. This type of joint allows real movement only in one plane, 
which is exactly what you can see here in this section. However, thanks to the oval structure of the condyle, some rotational movement is also possible. An example of a type of joint is the temporomandibular joint. In fact, its main function is to allow the mandible to lift and lower to determine the movements of mastication. However, there is a small potential lateral movement of the mandible given by the limited condylar movement on another plane. In the end, condylar arthrosis allows for the movement mainly in one dimension, and only to a very small extent also in a second dimension. Arthrodial joints, on the other hand, are joints where both ends are concave and convex, allowing small slips along the three dimensions. An example of these joints can be found at the vertebra, in the joints between the vertebral processes at the arch. These small joints do not allow for large movements. Therefore, in the spine, the large movement is given by the sequence of arthrodial joints. The lateral ganglimus is a joint where one end of the bone is horseshoe-shaped while the other is cylindrical. This joint revolves around its own axis. For example, in the proximal radial ulnar joint, which is part of the elbow joint, it allows the rotation of the forearm. This type of joint does not allow movements on the other axis. The angular ganglimus, on the other hand, forms between one end, which is bull-shaped, and the other end, which has a complementary shape. The only movement is that of an angular rotation. As you can see, an example of this structure is the ulna humerus joint. It is part of the elbow joint and allows flexion, and it is the extension of the forearm. While the saddle joint is a rarer, yet much more mobile joint, as the two ends are U-shaped, saddle-shaped, and as they cross in the middle. This allows for almost complete movement in as many as two axes. An example of this joint is at the joint between the first metacarpal and the carpal bones. The only type of movement that these joints do not provide is rotation on the axis. The last type of the arthrosis is an arthrosis, which is formed between a sphere shaped and a completely concave cavity. As it has the highest degree of mobility and therefore enables complex movement of circumduction, this joint will be able to rotate along all the axes. An example is the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral. Well, let's now move on to the muscles. Muscles can be classified according to several criteria. The first is shape. We talk about long muscles when one dimension exceeds the others, with a typical shape, thinner beginning and end, and a more slender center. The beginning and end of the muscle are called tendons, while the center is called the belly. Then there are the broad muscles, which have tendinous bands and not single tendons. The muscle bellies will also be flattened. Finally, there are the orbicularis oculi muscles that are ring-shaped and want to have true tendons as they graft onto themselves. The second classification criterion is the bellies. We speak of biceps muscles when the belly is forked on one side and single on the other, having also two tendons on one side. We speak of the gastric muscles when there are two bellies interspersed with a tendon. Finally, we speak of multigastric muscles when the number of bellies exceeds two. The bellies will always be interspersed with thin tendon layers. While well, generally speaking, multigastric muscles are also flat muscles. The last classification criterion is the direction of the fibers. We speak of parallel fiber muscles if all the fibers run in the same direction. We speak of pennate muscles if the fibers are oriented in two directions, inclined from each other of about 90 degrees. And finally, we speak of semipennate muscles if the inclination of the fibers is not that of the major axis of the muscle. From a more microscopic point of view, the muscle bundle is made up of smaller and smaller groups of muscle cells 
down to the single fibro cell. That are also a connected sheath depending on the type of layer they enclose. They have a very peculiar structure, especially under the electron microscope. They have a striated band structure with a particular electromechanical coupling. For more on this part, please refer to the relative video in the histology playlist. Thank you for watching. This video was created by School of Biomedical Sciences Agora. We hope you enjoyed it. If you're curious or have any doubt or question, please feel free to leave a comment below. If you want to find out more about us or want to support our project, click on the following link to visit our website.